All right. Well, hello and welcome everybody to day four of NCAT's 2023 conference, Growing Hope, Practical Tools for Our Changing Climate. I'm Agriculture Specialist Nina Prater, and I'm excited to kick off today's session on grazing for climate. Well-managed grazing can be a powerful tool for sequestering carbon in grasslands. Grazers around the world are seeing the benefits of adaptive management grazing, benefits to their soil, productivity, livestock health, profitability, and more, making their farms and ranches more resilient in the long term. There are claims out there that livestock farming is a major cause of climate change, and conversely, that livestock farming will save us all from climate change. Uh, we believe that somewhere between these hyperbolic claims, the practice of raising grass-based livestock carefully and conscientiously is a beautiful way to build soil health, maintain diverse grassland ecosystems, and grow nourishing food for our communities. If you were one of the first 600 conference registrants, you should have received a conference workbook printed on recycled paper in your snail mail box. And we hope you'll follow along in the workbook, uh, taking notes, jotting down questions, um, and after the sessions, reflecting on some prompts that we offered for you. And if you didn't get one and you'd like to print one out, you can download it at atra.ncat.org slash annual hyphen conference. And we'd like to acknowledge our conference sponsors. This year's conference is free for all attendees, and that's been made possible by the generous support of NCAT, ATRA Sustainable Agriculture, USDA Rural Development, Rural South Institute, Western SARE, Hemp Industries Association, and Clearwater Credit Union. Thank you. All right, so now we get to start with uh, today's session with Carl Tiedemann, co-founder of the group Soil for Climate. There will be some time, some Q&A time after Carl's presentation, so if you have questions during his talk, uh, please feel free to write them in the chat or Q&A box, and we will get to as many of them as we can. Um, and then after that, we will move into the farmer panel and hear from four livestock farmers, Malloy and Megan Lannon, Janet McNally, and Denise Rackley, who are all practicing adaptive management grazing and have seen firsthand the power of this management strategy to heal the soil, the water cycle, and the broader ecosystems they work within. And after the panel is over, we hope you will stay on for our optional networking session where you'll get the chance to discuss the material you've heard and ask our speakers any questions you might still have. And now it is my honor to welcome and introduce Carl Tiedemann. Carl is co-founder of Soil for Climate, a US-based nonprofit advocating for soil restoration as a climate solution. Carl is a passionate advocate for climate beneficial agriculture with a message of hope grounded in the latest science. Carl, welcome to Growing Hope. Thank you, Nina. It's an honor and pleasure to be here. And thank you to everyone who, watching for joining us today. And um, I'd like to start with just a little music. Mm -hmm. 
For those who don't recognize this song, it's called Grazing in the Grass by the great Hugh Masekela. It's a wonderful song and it just seemed like a appropriate way to start off the day today. So moving right along, a um, little bit of music. And now I'd like to uh, recite a poem. This is not one of mine, but I hope it'll set the tone for my talk and, and our presentation. It's called Ode to Dirt and it's written by Sharon Olds. Dear Dirt, I am sorry I slighted you. I thought that you were only the background for the leading characters, the plants and animals and human animals. It's as if I had loved only the stars and not the sky which gave them space in which to shine. Subtle, various, sensitive, you are the skin of our terrain. You're our democracy. When I understood I had never honored you as a living equal, I was ashamed of myself as if I had not recognized a character who looks so different from me. But now I can see us all made of the same basic materials, cousins of that first exploding from nothing in our intricate equation together. Oh, dirt, help us find ways to serve your life, you who have brought us forth and fed us, and who in the end will take us in and rotate with us and wobble and orbit. And now I'd like to go into my presentation. I'm going to share my screen and here we go. And all right. So hopefully everyone can see my screen now. It's working, good. All right. Um, I would like to start by thinking of the world, asking you to think of the world as a whole. Very often climate science has been brought down to atmospheric physics, but it's not just about the air, it's about the oceans and the land and how they all interact in a large holistic system. So to think about solving the climate issue, we need to think about how all these parts work together. For example, we see an image here of a rainforest and what's going on, is it raining or is the water coming off of the trees? And we can see that it's a cycle as our, um, many things in nature. Uh, it's not like the carbon just doesn't go somewhere and stop. It's a constant movement. We have the, the mineral cycle, uh, mineral cycles, the water cycle, energy flow, and community dynamics. When you, I'll be talking today primarily about grasslands because it's on grazing. Uh, this was an exhibit from the uh, National uh, Botanical Museum. We can see that when you look out on a grassland, most of the activity is invisible. It's below ground. There are roots that can go down 12 and 15 feet deep. Uh, roughly a quarter of the biomass is above surface, but most of it is below. The roots are incredibly important because that's what's taking the carbon and, and pumping it down into the ground. The crisis that we face today worldwide is soil degradation. Here's an image showing uh, five feet of topsoil loss in New Mexico, this had all happened in approximately 100 or 150 years uh, after the Europeans came in and, and started uh, disrupting the natural cycles that had been present here on the continent for a long time. Um, paleobotanist Greg Ritalik from University of Oregon uh, has done work looking at the evolution of grasslands on the planet and mostly through studying um, pollen spores and, and uh, paleontology, um, that field. And we understand now that grasslands first appeared about 40 million years ago on the planet. And since that time, um, grazing animals co-evolved with the grasses. Grasses require grazing. And that's the first point I'd like to make today. Grazing is not optional. When grass plants are not grazed, particularly in drier environments, um, they will ultimately uh, smother and shade themselves to death. And the result is the soil no longer gets fed and desertification gets in. Uh, ultimately, what happens is uh, large scale erosion sets in when the soil is no longer held together you know, by its glues. Um, and we end up seeing, as we do now, including on national parks. I mean, this should be a, a revered place in, in our nation. And instead, it's become a site of terrific erosion. And a lot of us, because of something called presentism, we look at it and we think that, well, this is how it's always been. But there are important clues. If you look at the silvery plants in the foreground here and, and in back left, we can see they're oxidizing. It wasn't all that long ago that there were healthy green growing plants here. Back in 2007, David Montgomery wrote a book 
as uh, dirt the erosion of civilizations in which he described how more than 20 civilizations throughout history failed when their soils became so degraded they were no longer able to feed their citizens. Sadly, this is something that we see going on today all over the world. I'm going to go quickly toward the beginning part of my presentation, which is a little bit of background on, on climate science. Uh, this is a slide showing a pair of um, NASA satellites. They're called GRACE. They, uh, the way they work is not to measure the gravitation directly, but NASA can measure very accurately the distance between these two, this pair of satellites as they're orbiting the Earth. And depending on how their orbits slightly change, depending on the gravitational pull down below, we can determine how much groundwater uh, is present. And we can see now that large parts of the planet are, are drying out. And I hope that someday this technology will be able to uh, show us the, the soils becoming healthier and the reservoirs recharging and so on. Carbon dioxide, which is of course essential for life, uh, has been going up steadily. We know at least since 1957 when Charles David Keeling began his monitoring out in Hawaii. Um, before then, it had been thought that because the earth was so large and the oceans were so immense, that no matter what humans did, the impact was unlikely to be significant. In fact, when Charles David Keeling began to, um, taking his measurements during the International Geophysical Year, which was actually a year and a half from 1957, 1958, um, he calibrated his equipment, made his measurements, came back sometime later. And when he took a measure, he was surprised to see that the number had changed. And he thought at first there must be a mistake with his equipment. But sure enough, he went back year after year after year and noticed that the, uh, the amounts kept increasing steadily. We see that it's a sawtooth effect. And what that is, is essentially the earth breathing. So each summer or each spring, when the leaves grow, they pull carbon dioxide out of the air, the level goes down substantially. And then the fall, when the leaves fall off the trees, decompose, the carbon goes back into the air. The reason that the North and Southern hemispheres don't cancel each other out is because far more of the North is in growing land, far more of the Southern hemisphere is in ocean. So uh, this shows that we get a very significant drawdown each year that that's going on, which gives us the clue that we can begin to use nature to remove some of this excess carbon from the air. So CO2 emissions are going up, the pandemic hardly made a blip in this. So when did the human problem uh, or contribution to climate change begin? Back in 2005, William Ruderman, put out a hypothesis uh, looking at mostly ice core records where we can see very clearly what the atmospheric chemistry was now going back approximately 800,000 years. The way ice coring works, it's truly amazing. Uh, essentially teams go up in some cases to the, some of the highest mountain peaks on the planet and using solar technology. So there won't be any gasoline or diesel generators possibly you know, causing contamination. Ice core samples are taken. Each one is about the size of a baseball bat. It's then very carefully put into a refrigerated unit, solar powered on yaks or, or llamas or what have you, transported down into waiting ships and then brought out to Ohio State University, which maintains the world's largest um, deposit repository of ice core samples from around the world. Some of these samples can reach up to two miles long. So imagine taking two miles of ice, just uh, basically three feet or a meter at a time. Anyway, the ice is then sliced very carefully in the lab uh, and it's evaporated or melted and the gases that come out provide a clue as to what was going on at different times in, in Earth's history. Anyway, what Ruderman showed is that about 10,000 years ago, humans, although we're still very small in population, only about 10 million of us, it's thought um, because of deforestation and burning and plowing and mismanaged grazing began liberating so much carbon dioxide from the soil that it actually had a warming effect on the planet. Many people are surprised to learn because all you hear is about the industrial era and CO2 beginning in the 19 or the 1850s and so forth. Surprisingly, the amount of carbon liberated from fossil fuels did not surpass that from soil cultivation until around the mid 1960s or so. So we've got this long tail of disruption uh, to the atmosphere and into the soil going back um, thousands, literally thousands of years. Jonathan Sanderman at uh, Woodwell, uh, which is a, a, a climate think tank in, in Massachusetts, uh, estimates that several hundred billion tons of carbon were liberated by the early farmers. And oddly enough, if history repeated itself, we would be in a cooling cycle now, 
But instead, what happened for the last 10,000 years, there was, there was this very strange, anomalous stability of temperature. And what's currently thought now is that the cooling, the natural cooling trend that would have been occurring was offset by the carbon that was being released by early farmers inadvertently. Um, and that's what created the Holocene, the stable climate region um, uh, period during which civilization basically flourished. Anyway, today we see temperatures going up. Um, we know through an elaborate uh, ocean monitoring system, there are thousands of these probes that go down and measure salinity and temperature and oxygen and so forth. And they pop up every so often to transmit the information to a satellite. So we're starting to get this three-dimensional image of the ocean. And what we see that the vast majority of the heat being created um, through climate forcing, about 90, 93% is going into the ocean. So all of the effects that we're seeing now in terms of warmer temperatures and melting glaciers and, and so thinning of the sea ice and so forth is approximately 10% or less of the total heat that's being received. So, um, so all of that heat is going into the ocean. The ocean is on roughly a 1500 year turnover cycle. So much of the heat going into the ocean will not even be coming out until long after all of us are gone. And so when we think about this, it's it's not just about what happens by the year 2100. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it's important to note, is, is not a scientific organization, which many people think it is. It is a governmental organization that's informed by scientists. But what that means is the scientists don't get the final word. Basically, the diplomats from each country will vote on what they want included in the document or not. So as an example, the mandate for the IPCC is, um, is for the year 2100. So any of the estimates you hear, the 1.5 degrees warming, two degrees warming, they're all talking about 2100. But of course, at 2100, physics just doesn't stop. And we know now that the, the warming effect will continue for centuries, if not millennia, unless we take action quickly to, to address this problem. Mostly what we hear as solutions is cutting fossil fuel emissions, which is a great idea for a lot of reasons, but that doesn't do anything about the legacy carbon in the atmosphere. Neither does it address the problem of the carbon that's missing from the soil, which has been contributing to flooding and to droughts and so forth. So we see sea level rise going up. Uh, there is some forecast, if you take the really long term, that we could be looking up up to nine meters of, of sea level rise would be the, equal, in other words, 40 feet higher uh, would be the equilibrium sea level rise. Um, and we see more pronounced warming at the poles. A very dramatic story that's been going on over the last 40 years now is the loss of the Arctic sea ice. Unlike Antarctica, where there's a mountain, so it's elevated and colder. At the Arctic, there is no continent, so it's basically just an ice cube, and it's been melting significantly. Why is this a concern? Well, what this graph shows briefly is uh, a temperature reconstructed from foraminifera to fossil plankton, and you can tell by studying the oxygen ratios in it what the temperature of the ocean was. Anyway, when we compare that to the, uh, the CO2 levels, we can see a pretty close match over the past 400,000 years. So we know that when CO, CO2 levels in the atmosphere are higher, it, uh, at the same time, ocean, uh, the world's temperature is warm as well. Here we see the very dramatic uptick in carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. Susan Solomon, the atmospheric scientist at MIT, former co-chair of the IPCC, said that if we, um, if we even if we stop emissions now, warming will continue, she expected, for about 1,000 years. Uh, the IPCC dutifully reported this, and um, uh, in 2013, whoops, sorry about that. Oh, well, um, and which they said, uh, um, let me go back one, I'm sorry, here we go, uh, that we're, that the climate, anthropogenic climate change is irreversible on a multi-century to millennial timescale, except in the case of a large net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. At the same time, the United Nations Convention to Combat Certification said that the potential for land to hold carbon and act as a sink for greenhouse gases is unparalleled. Uh, this, the ocean is the largest repository of, of carbon on the planet. The second largest is soil. Amazingly, it wasn't only until it wasn't until 2015 that the IPCC officially recognized soil, thanks to the efforts of Stefan Lafall, who was France's Minister of Agriculture, uh, who 
um, who made it into the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. So how do we deal with the climate crisis? There are all types of solutions being offered. Some of these are very energy and resource intense, uh, very technologically driven, um, using you know, large amounts of energy, tampering with the environment. The approach that that I am promoting specifically is, is healing the planet, which is why I, uh, there's a term geotherapy that was coined back in the 1980s, which I found very appealing, basically healing the planet instead of engineering the planet. Uh, right now, with the emissions that civilization gives off, some of them go into the ocean where it's causing acidification, some goes into the atmosphere where it's resulting in, in warming and forcing. And some of it is going into the terrestrial environment, into soil, where it's actually a net positive and net beneficial. So our goal is to reduce the other two bubbles, the atmosphere and the ocean, and to try to get it back into the ground. Uh, you may be familiar with Elaine Ingham's work on the soil food web. Uh, when we talk about soil, it's not just clay, silt, and sand. It's it's the life that lives in the soil as well. And you've probably heard the statistics that there were you know, literally billions of, uh, of microscopic creatures and even just a tablespoon of soil, the, the complexity and the amount of life that's going on in healthy soil is, is almost beyond comprehension. Uh, here we see a graphic of roots showing how deep they go, go down. On the far upper left, you can see basically uh, lawn grass with very, very shallow roots. Uh, most annual plants as well tend to have pretty shallow root systems and um, uh, grass plants, um, have much deeper roots, excuse me, that can go down 10 to 12 feet. And that's important because that the roots are what are delivering the carbon into the ground. And the more carbon that's in the soil, the more water the soil can hold. So when you have a healthy system with plants feeding that carbon into the ground, uh, this statistic is each 1% increase in soil or organic matter allows soil to hold approximately another 20,000 gallons of water per acre. So what happens is when we improve that soil carbon sponge, uh, to use Walter Yenny's term, uh, the groundwater begins to rise again, and it'll come back in surface water, ponds, lakes, streams, rivers that have been dried up for years, decades, or centuries can be brought back to flow. It, it amazes me in all of the discussions I hear about, for example, the Colorado River, you know, what are we going to do about how, how much its flow is reduced? We hear, well, let's pull less water out of it, which certainly makes sense. But the river itself will not come back to its full glory until we heal the watershed all around the river. And when we do that, then, then gradually over time, the rivers will come back to their flow. Um, another great reason for improving soil is, uh, as some new research has been showing, is the nutritional density of food increases with healthier soil. Um, so there are different practices that, that are being put in, uh, intercropping, uh, covering cropping, keeping roots in the soil year round. This is a photo showing uh, biochar, which some of you may be familiar with. It was used by the uh, pre-Columbian Amazons going back several thousand years in Brazil. Uh, where wood or really any organic matter, when it's heated up in a low oxygen environment, basically becomes not quite pure carbon, but pretty close to pure carbon. And it acts uh, as a fertilizer, not in the conventional sense of providing minerals and nutrients, but because of its structure, it holds moisture and minerals extremely well. And it makes the soil fertile and it does not wear out. And it's, a, it's one way that carbon can be essentially locked up. Uh, I'll talk briefly about the word sequester. Uh, I understand that sequester means kidnapped. And when you sequester carbon in soil, you're not locking it under lock and key the way that you are in some of these other um, uh, carbon capture technologies. Instead, the carbon is constantly recycling through the soil or cycling through the soil. And what we want is to have more carbon going into the soil than what is coming out. So an individual carbon atom that goes in the soil might not stay there you know, all that long, maybe days, weeks, months, or so forth. But over time, the soil will build up. And we look at the Great Plains, there was soil 10, 12 feet deep uh, um, when the Europeans first arrived. And that soil that had built up over uh, 10,000 years since the uh, glaciers uh, last came through and scraped all of it away. So carbon-rich soil can, can build up absolutely over time. Uh, this brings me to the work of Alan Savory, and it's um, 
it's quite remarkable to think that in 10,000 years of grazing, uh, the grazing was was harmful during that entire period. No humans, and I want to be absolutely clear about this, uh, there are many indigenous practices that are, that are extremely useful for soil health, uh, companion planting and, and cover cropping and in uh, agroforestry and so on. But uh, to the best of my knowledge, no early, pe early peoples learned how to graze, manage grazing in a way that was beneficial for the land. Um, here in North America, uh, the natives would tip, would often build fires and they would clear out grasses and that would basically invite the animals in to make them easier for hunting and so on. So in that way, there was some management of the of the animal movement, but there was there was no thought given to trying to group animals together into a herd and move them in a way that would mimic how the natural grazing uh, took place. Um, Many of you may have seen Alan Savory's TED Talk. If not, I highly recommend it. Uh, Alan was uh, born in Zimbabwe um, back when it was Rhodesia. And he was, as a young man in his early 20s, he was tasked with trying to improve the soil in all these national parks that were degraded. And his searching for an answer ultimately brought him to the work of Andre Voisin, who was a French grazing scientist in the 1950s, who realized how important it was to to group the animals together and move them around periodically, allowing enough time for the grasses to grow back. Now, it's interesting, there was a, a farmer, a Scottish farmer in the 1770s, James Anderson, who actually wrote about uh, subdividing your pasture into, he suggested 20 different sections and then moving the animals after they'd had their fill of each one and so forth. So, so it's an old idea. But practically speaking, it wasn't possible because the only technology available were stone walls. And it would have been impossible to subdivide a pasture, you know, using all stone. It's hard enough just to build a stone wall surrounding your, your entire land. Uh, as we see, I'm speaking to you now from Vermont, as we see throughout New England, you know, remnants of all these old stone walls from the sheep farming days. Um, and today, of course, with the evolution of, uh, of the uh, the poly wire, it's become so much easier uh, for managing animals. Uh, we work, um, Soil of Climate works with uh, grazers in, in Kenya, and they use herding, traditional methods, not even any fencing. Basically, they're often teenage boys that'll stay with the animals and, and move them along. So as Alan Savory discusses in his TED Talk, throughout the uh, world, we can see large areas of land desertifying. The great grasslands of the world are now mostly desert. Um, the, the statistics are, are quite horrifying when you see just how, how much soil degradation is taking place. It's estimated at approximately, according to a 2013 paper by Pimentel, approximately 75 um, billion tons of soil per year. That is 10 tons of soil per person per year globally are lost through erosion. Uh, back, it was the, the bison years ago that... Uh, with an estimated population as high as 75 million that maintain the health of the Great Plains here in, in North America. And, and of course, before then, we had the, the mammoths and these other Ice Age animals, um, including uh, there, were, there were camels. And there was, there was a giant bison that was about 50% larger than the bison that exists today. And uh, for comparison, I looked up some numbers recently for the weight and the size and the giant bison were about eight feet tall and about as 15 feet long. It's incredible, about the same dimensions as a Cadillac SUV, if you can imagine that. And, uh, and of course, it wasn't just the bison, it was other animals in pronghorn and in um, gophers of prairie dogs and you know countless other species as well. Interestingly, some people think that bison are somehow softer on the land or easier on the land than cows. And that's because of the myth that the cow is somehow a defective animal. Uh, you've, you've probably heard the expression, it's not the cow, it's the how. And the fact is that any time harm is done by livestock, the fault or the responsibility rests with the person managing the animal, not with the animal itself. No animal, when it is interacting with nature in the way that it evolved, is harmful for the land. Otherwise, the animal wouldn't be here or the land wouldn't be here. Um, and so uh, bison, Unfortunately, they were nearly exterminated. Their population fell down. I've heard estimates as low as 50,000 at one time or another. Today, we have about half a million bison, so roughly half a percent of their original population. Simply not enough 
to provide the grazing impact needed to, to keep the Great Plains healthy. But we do have about 100 million cows in North America that if we are able to use them effectively can in fact keep this continent healthy. Uh, this is a paper from our drawing from uh, one of Greg Ritalik's paper. Here it's showing uh, different rainfall regimes from, from left to right, from dry to, to very humid. And we see that in Africa, there is much more carbon in the soil than in Australia. And the reason for this is that the that ruminants never developed, never evolved in Australia. And so their soils are lower in carbon for that reason. Uh, it's estimated that ungulates add approximately 50 tons of carbon per hectare. So we see, understand now that animals, grasses, and soils are all part of a large system. This image, if you haven't seen it, is kind of shocking. It's of uh, bison skulls during the great cull that took place. Uh, the, after the Civil War, the US Army was dispatched to help kill off the bison population as a way of subjugating the native uh, population. And ultimately there were bounties put on each skull so anybody could go out and bring in a skull. And, and tragically, ironically, the skulls and bones were ground up to make phosphorus. So after fertilizing the North America for literally millions of years, there was one final uh, flush of fertilization from the dead bones. And it's a, it's a crazy story. Um, and we see now that uh, you know it's the the end of soil and the beginning of desertification when the bison were wiped out. Soil needs animals. This picture was from the 1930s, the Dust Bowl, but we see scenes like this being repeated today, tragically. Uh, here's a, a farm tour. Alan Savory is pointing out uh, some of the oxidizing plants that are going on because of inadequate animal impact. We see bare spaces between the plants and so on. This is a close-up showing what happens when uh, plants oxidize over time. Uh, my colleague Seth Itzkan, the co-founder of Soil for Climate, was the first one I know to use this line, which is that overgrazing is a human invention. And, um, and maybe this is a good time to talk about like what is overgrazing. And another myth I'd like to clear up is that many people think overgrazing is from having too many animals. It sounds logical. If you have a certain number of animals, you introduce more animals, there's going to be overgrazing. That's what people think. Well, it's wrong. And Andre Voisin, the French grazing scientist I mentioned back in the 1950s, he figured out that overgrazing is caused not by the number of animals, but by how much time they have access to the grass plants. There's an analogy that might be helpful. It's sometimes called the 100 lawnmower analogy, I guess. Uh, if you have a lawn to mow, you can go out and use one lawn mower, or you can use 100 lawn mowers, and at the end of the day, the lawn is going to look the same. What happens is how long you wait, or what's important is how long you wait before bringing the lawn mowers back. So if you go out and mow your lawn, just one lawn mower, every single day, that grass is never going to come back. In fact, ultimately, it will die because it's not having a chance to, to grow fully and express itself and, and so on. In the same way, when you have too many animals, um, there may not be enough forage for, for the animals, but as long as you move them at least every three days to get them to a fresh paddock, because what happens is after three days, three days after being grazed, a plant will um, sprout new growth leaves which the cows or other grazers are attracted to, you know, the, the sweet, tender leaves and so forth. And so they'll t tend to come back and keep grazing that plant. So it's crucial to get them up to a new paddock within three days so that that overgrazing, that second bite is where the overgrazing happens. So uh, for the grazers out there, uh, here's a question. Uh, suppose you have um, too many animals, then you have enough forage for if the grazing is still managed properly, what will happen is the grass will continue to improve. The animals may suffer weight loss, but the grass will still be, so even if you put a thousand animals on a small piece of land, as long as you're moving them, say every hour, or every two hours or, or what have you, the grass will never suffer. The land will never suffer. It is impossible to hurt the land by having too many animals. It's all about the timing. It's all about the movement. 
And so today we can use livestock uh, or flurids. We can have goat, goats and sheep mixed in with cows and so forth. The critical thing is to making sure the animals are in the right place for the right reason. And how do we do that? We set up a grazing plan. We set up a chart so that we can subdivide our property uh, or the ranch or farm. We might be leasing it. Um, how many paddocks do you need to do successful grazing? Dr. Richard Teague, recently retired from Texas A&M, probably the world's foremost regenerative grazing specialist, studied a number of farms identified by the, um, the Natural Resource Conservation Service as being the most successful ones. And what he realized that they were all using a minimum of 30 paddocks, in some cases as many as 45 or 50 paddocks, you need to have enough paddocks to give you that flexibility and control so you can speed up the movement of the paddocks or slow it down in response to changing environmental conditions and changing plant growth. So if you go through a cold spell or a wet spell, there's enough um, slack in the system uh, that you can make sure the animals are in the right place at the right time for the right reason. And uh, here we see a, a dried out riverbed in Africa because of land degradation. When land becomes destroyed like that, Typically, the answer is um, bringing in, in food and making people, unfortunately, dependent on, on getting you know, grain that's brought in. And instead, just a, a few miles away, this happens to be at the Africa Center for Holistic Management uh, in Zimbabwe. Instead, uh, on the same day, there, there, there's rivers flowing with clean, fresh water. There are a couple of shots here of what's possible by bringing the animals back. This is from 2004, 2007. Here's another site. 2006, 2009, just three years later. Um, a, a fascinating aspect of, of grazing is that there are seeds lying in what's called the seed bank, the top layer of the soil, and the seeds can be viable there for decades or possibly even up to 100 years. And what happens is as the soil starts to become healthier, Eventually, it'll get to the point where it's the seeds recognize the soil is healthier and they will sprout and grow. So sometimes we hear talk of uh, tree planting projects, for example, the Great Green Wall in Africa and so on. And sadly, many of those planting projects fail for the reason that tree seedlings will not thrive in degraded soil. If you have somebody there watering it every day and that level of care, yes, then absolutely it's possible. But when you're talking about trying to bring thousands, millions, ultimately billions of acres or hectares back to life, instead by using grazing and making the land healthier, the soil, once the grasses start growing, eventually the soil will, will become healthy enough that all the tree seeds that are lying there dormant will sprout and begin growing on their own so we can so we, we can bring trees back without planting any trees i know it sounds crazy but um this is what we see uh this is a site uh that was dug out a farmer dug out this watering hole so the animals could come here and today the site's unrecognizable and sometimes you know we'll like to ask which um before or after has more water in the picture and in fact this a restored landscape now has much more water in it. And where did the animals go to drink? This, the streams and the brooks that had dried up have come back to flow. So the animals are now able to get water where they used to in the past. Just a comparison here between continuous grazing or what's known as AMP grazing. Uh, AMP stands for adaptive multi-paddock grazing. It's a synonym for holistic plan grazing that was coined by Alan Savory. Uh, uh, my colleague Seth and I have put together a compendium. Uh, presently, it has uh, 23 scientific papers in it looking at different aspects of regenerative grazing. Um, we, we're happy to make that available. I can provide a link for that if anybody would like to get that. Uh, three of the highlight papers from there show that typically on the order of a ton of carbon per acre per year uh, it can be added to soil through proper grazing management. A myth that you will hear repeatedly is that it uh, it takes a, a 500 to 1,000 years to, to form an inch of soil. And one of the things that shocked me when I was reading um, Michael Pollan's book, uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma, uh, years ago, I, I read about Joel Salatin. It was the first time I'd heard about him. Uh, many of you may know Joel Salatin. He's the um, self-described lunatic farmer. And uh, it said that in the book that Joel had been able to restore 
like two or three inches of soil in a 10 year period. And I thought, well, how is that possible? If you go to the USDA website, you'll see, as I said, it takes 500 or a thousand years. I had the opportunity to speak once with David Montgomery, who wrote that book, Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations, and has a, several books out since then, including uh, Growing a Revolution. Um, and I asked David, where did I, that estimate come from that it took so long? And he told me it was uh, Charles Darwin in the 1880s, toward the end of his life, uh, Darwin, who is known primarily as a geologist, biology was kind of a side interest, uh, and his sons went to Roman ruins in England. They knew the ruins were about 2,000 years old, and they measured approximately two inches of soil on top of these ruins. So it was a pretty easy calculation, and it became accepted that it took 1,000 years to form an inch of soil. What Darwin may not have been thinking about at the time, clearly, is that on top of a ruin might not be the, the best way to, to form or grow new soil. Um, in fact, that soil that had formed on top of the ruins may have been tracked in by animals or blown in by the wind or the rain or so forth. And by comparison, we now have some farmers, uh, ranchers, uh, Dr. Alan Williams talks about this, that are able to form an inch of new topsoil per year which is a stunning rate. And to understand how that is even possible, it's important to know that it's it's not just a matter, when we think of soil being built to form, we think of it sort of as layers, like pieces of paper, and we're adding one layer after another, but that's not how it works at all. Uh, Christine Jones explains that most soil forms about a foot below ground, um, on the nodes of plants is where the, the biochemical processes are actually happening that are producing these compounds, the, the glues that, that we think of as, as forming soil. And when the glues form, it creates aggregates or clumps that you see, sometimes they're called dreads, you know, um, like dreadlocks, when you uh, pull a plant out of the ground and you can see how thick and coated the roots are, the, the rhizosphere is a technical name for it. Um, so that's actually where the soil is forming. And, and when you're, gluing together all these little pieces underground, you're also creating air pockets in channels. So it's been estimated, uh, Dr. John Norman, a biophysicist who led um, the soil testing and uh, extensive testing project at, at Gabe Brown's farm, estimate that uh, Gabe's soil uh, is approximately 60% air. So when you walk on his farm, it, everywhere you go, it feels spongy. So there's by having tremendous amounts of air underneath the ground, all these different channels and openings, it allows for the moisture to get in, to get in and the life in the soil, all the reactions that happen, happen on, on aqueous layers. All the biochemistry happens. Um, so the more surface area you have underground, the more the biology can express itself. Uh, this graph I'm showing here, this bar graph is uh, from one of Richard Teague's papers basically estimating um, how much carbon emissions we have presently in scenario number one, given today's production methods and scenario number five, I won't go through all of it, but shows if we are able to uh, adopt better cropping practices and better grazing practices, we can essentially offset approximately three or four times more than what the total emissions from agriculture are right now. So agriculture is unique in being pretty much the only industry poised to go not only carbon neutral, which is not good enough, but carbon negative to a very substantial degree. And I need to be clear, this does not give a get out of jail card uh, to the fossil fuel interest. Trying to offset the tremendous amount of carbon that we're pumping into the atmosphere every year is will be a fool's errand unless we also begin cutting the carbon uh, emissions and the burden of fuel as well. Uh, as a follow-up to what I was saying about topsoil formation, Christine Jones says that topsoil formation can be breathtakingly rapid. And she's asked, well, why do so many scientists deny this phenomenon of rapid soil building? And she explains it's because they do their research in places where it's not happening, where the carbon is running down and the soils are deteriorating. So the new pro approach that's being taken is to measure the carbon on farms where soil building is occurring and learn what those farmers or ranchers are doing to make it happen. And thankfully, this is uh, taking place right now. Entomologist Jonathan Lundgren in 2021 
uh, began a survey of a thousand regenerative farms across the country, and we're starting to get very good data on exactly what is possible. Uh, in the past, the criticism has been we're only looking at a handful of farms, and, and now we are starting to get the numbers. And here's, as I mentioned, Dr. Alan Williams saying we can get uh, basically an inch of, of new topsoil formation per year, which is truly stunning. Um, this brings up the issue of you might hear like carbon saturation, like you might hear like soil is great, but it gets saturated with carbon within a, within 10 years or 20 years or so forth. And the response to that from microbiologist David Johnson is that yes, there's a limit to how much carbon soil can hold, but there is no limit, practically speaking, to how much soil can be formed. So we can always be adding more on um, to the soil. And Christine Jones will say, we can literally, improve soil, um, uh, the carbon in soil for thousands of years. So what happens when we begin moving the animals around properly, uh, the soil gets healthier and more grass begins growing. And this leads us to another myth that we hear, which is uh, you often hear the phrase, um, uh, less better meat. Um, thinking that if we begin to do grazing properly, that somehow we won't have as much meat available or as many animals, which is completely untrue. The fact is that once the soil begins getting healthier and more and more grass grows, we see sometimes doubling, sometimes a tripling uh, of carrying capacity. In uh, some more extreme cases, Alejandro Carrillo, who does grazing uh, in the Chihuahuan Desert, has increased his carrying capacity tenfold. So when land starts out severely degraded, you can make tremendous increases in carrying capacity. I just heard recently in the UK, there were proposals to cut down the number of animals. UK will never be able to hit its climate targets by cutting its livestock. And uh, anyway, which we, we just need to begin thinking about these things. Um, relative to wildlife, uh, nature is not a zero sum game. Some people will say, well, you can't have cows there because we need to have the wildlife there. And, and what they don't realize is that proper grazing of cows allows the land to heal so that all, um, I have quite a bit more I could say, but I'm conscious of the time. So uh, I think maybe this would be a, a good time to wrap up. Uh, I'll just um, close by saying that fortunately there are conservation organizations all over the world that are now using livestock as a way of, of bringing back the land and the health of, of the environment. Uh, here in North America, the National Audubon Society is working with about approximately uh, 3 million acres um, of land with ranches to restore the grasslands through proper grazing as a way of improving the songbird habitat uh, to deal with the, the songbird, um, the, the crash in the songbird population. So um, again, there's a lot more I could say, but, but maybe this is a, a good time to wrap up. So thank you all for your attention, much appreciated. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, if you can turn your video on again. Um, let's see, there you are. <laughs> uh, we just have time for a couple questions. Oh, my, you covered so much so quickly um, that uh, I'm glad this is being recorded so we can all go back and, and re-listen. Um, we have had a couple questions come in. Um, one is, could you comment on the uh, debate about enteric fermentation, or as people talk about it, cow burps, and the methane emissions that seems to be a major um, argument on one side of saying livestock are, in fact, making climate change worse? Sure. Um, cows burp uh, or have eructations, I believe it is formally what it's called. Uh, it's a steady stream of methane, um, as uh, do many other animals, uh, any other natural grazers, uh, deer and, and horses and, and bison and so forth. Uh, termites produce tremendous amounts of methane. Uh, swamps produce amazing amounts of methane. Uh, historically, methane was normal and natural, and it's biogenic carbon that the animals are recycling. So they're they're not adding any more to the system than would otherwise be present. Um, and excitingly, a 2018 paper uh, by Paige Stanley and Jason Roundtree showed that when grazing is managed properly during the finishing phase of, of beef production, 
more than enough carbon is sequestered to offset all of the greenhouse gases associated with, with the animals. So grazing done properly will remove carbon uh, from the atmosphere, will lower uh, the, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, there's a um, also there's a there's a new way of, of measuring the impact, a new metric for measuring the impact of global warming gases called uh, global warming potential star or, or GWP star that also rates methane uh, having a lower impact than what the GWP 100 or the GWP 20 standards have. Um, the another the final point I'll throw in there is that um, most of the research I've seen is that the major the, bulk of the methane building up in the atmosphere today is from fugitive emissions from fracking operations and from the pipelines that leak everywhere. Um, I, I think pointing the finger at, at cows when in fact they can be part of the solution is, is a misdirection. Thank you. Um, another question we got is, um, how do you recommend integrating managed grazing with aquifer recharging activities? Ah. That, that's a great question. Aquifers will come back on their own if we take care of the land above them. So I don't think that we need to have a, a, um, a special, um, other than just doing conservation cropping practices and regenerative grazing process, and anything that's improving soil health over time will help to restore it, uh, the hydrological cycle and you know, fix the, um, the, the, the natural water holding capability of land. Uh, it would be, I just heard a day or two ago about a, a new lithium mine, I forget New Mexico, or Arizona, the location, um, and it's been um, it's been protested uh, by Native American groups and environmentalists, but it, it seems like the mine has been giving permission to grow to move forward. The photograph they showed of this mine site is your typical Southwest American landscape, which is to say it looks like desert. Everybody who lives there think it's desert, but it's not. It's a highly degraded grassland. And wouldn't it be wonderful if the mining company, in exchange for being given the rights to go in and, and create what ultimately will be a, an ecological uh, mess, um, why not heal all the land? Why don't they do grazing to heal all the land around it? So at least in some small way, begin to offset the harm uh, that's taking place. Um, uh, NPR a couple of years ago ran a story about the terrible drought in, in Tucson, Arizona. And so I looked up to see what the um, rainfall was, the annual rainfall. And I was surprised to see it was 22 inches a year on average. In the year they were, NPR was reporting the drought, the rainfall was four inches above average. So it's kind of crazy. We know now that places getting as little as six or eight inches of rain per year can be brought back to, to grassland. So for people living in places that are getting 20, 22, 24 inches of rain a year, thinking it's desert, it's not. It's just speaking to the, the harm that's been done to the soil. Yeah, yeah. I've heard people talk about how we can create our own drought. You know, it doesn't really matter how much rain falls. It's how much we capture and hold. Exactly. So. Alan Savory has said every year will be a drought year going forward in, until we figure this out. And droughts and flooding are the same side or opposite size of, of the climate coin. When we, de or de when we degrade land, inevitably both drought and flooding will result. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. We have lots of questions coming in. I think we have time for maybe one more. Um, Let's see, we've had questions come in about integrating uh, poultry and hogs into grazing. Do you have any, uh, have you seen any uh, data on that, the effects of, of that getting? Uh, I'm, I'm not a farmer, so I would look more towards somebody like a Gabe Brown or a Joel Salatin, uh, a Greg Judy, you know, for experience and um, an actual animal husbandry and, and livestock movements and so on. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. The more, well, the more animals. Question. So I'll the ask more... one more. Okay. Uh, um, and this is kind of a challenge. Someone's pushing back a little. Um, sure. Many scientists disagree with Savory and have not been able to reproduce his results. Do you have any new evidence that Savory is right and his numerous critics are wrong? Sure. Just need to plug in for a second. Sorry about that. Um, Okay, this is one of the topics I was hoping we'd have a chance to get to. 
Uh, there was a paper that came out in 2017, a report from Oxford called Grazed and Confused, or by a team at Oxford, I should say. And many of the studies that they cite that purport to be a holistic plan grazing involve something like this. Uh, researchers will go out, they'll build a set of 10 paddocks, and they'll move the livestock through them like every three days, and then look at what the results are at the end. Now, there are a number of problems with anyone who's familiar with holistic plant grazing or Alan Savers' work will know that you can't just go out and move the animals around. You have to be monitoring how much grass growth there is, uh, what's the temperature been like, how much rainfall you've been getting. The reason Alan Savers' approach works is because you have to do it differently every time. In science, and I, my degrees in chemistry, I used to teach science, repeatability is a hallmark of science. If you're mixing chemicals in a test tube, anyone around the world should come up with the same results when you're mixing the same chemicals under the same conditions. Grazing is not like that. So many of these trials that have claimed to have been of holistic plan grazing, in fact, were not. They were looking at rotational grazing. Rotational grazing is typically thought of as being calendar-based, whereas adaptive multi-paddock grazing or holistic plan, plan grazing means making fine tune and making adjustments constantly as you go wrong, assuming that you're wrong. So I would say that many people who have said Alan Savory's method doesn't work, in fact, are not testing Alan Savory's method and or his approach. And so the research that has been coming in, thankfully from a new generation of researchers, I would have to say, are cognizant of these nuances. And instead of trying to set up an arbitrary system and do it by rote, instead we're studying the ranchers and the farmers who are skilled. And actually what we're testing is not Alan Savory's approach, but we're testing the skill and the knowledge of those farmers and of those ranchers. And that's where the success is coming from. Holistic plan grazing is not a system, it is a decision-making process. And that's why it is so powerful. Well, I can't think of a perfect, more perfect way to end your your uh, time with us because that transitions perfectly into our our conversation with four grazers who are doing that approach of adjusting and monitoring and changing and going with the seasons and. So um, thank you so much, Carl, for sharing all of that knowledge and wisdom. That was really excellent. And I really appreciate your, your time and expertise. I look forward to hearing from the others. Thanks. Um, and remember, folks, if you have questions for Carl, he'll be sticking around afterwards for the networking session. Um, and so you can ask him more questions then. Um, and I just want to acknowledge another sponsor. Um, this year's conference is free to all attendees, and that's been made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, including the Hemp Industries Association. The Hemp Industries Association started in 1994 as a group of hemp business and activist leaders came together with the shared goals of setting standards for hemp products and legalizing hemp in the U.S. To focus their efforts, they formed the HIA, a volunteer-led, mission-driven, and democratically governed trade association. Learn more at the HIA.org. And now I'm going to hand the mic over to my colleague, regenerative grazing specialist, Linda Poole. Linda is going to be moderating our panel discussion with our four amazing graziers. Linda, the floor is yours. This is an incredible honor to be following that presentation by Carl. I, I don't know how you felt about that, but isn't it great to know that the grass needs us as grazers, just like we need the grass. And what we've got here today is we've got some, uh, some shepherds and grazers from across the U.S. who will be telling us how they are um, managing the cow and the how the sheep and the grass enable to enable us to be uh, climate beneficial and, and be able to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. So thank you for joining us today with this. Um, what we'll do is if you would be kind enough to record your questions and comments in the chat box um, or through the Q&A, uh, 
options at the bottom of your screen there, you'll be able to get those to where we can see them later on. Because these uh, women who are going to be talking to you are so skilled, I'm pretty sure we're going to have way more questions than we can handle at, uh, through the discussion at the end of this. So stick around. Um, at the end of the presentations, we'll have a half hour networking and breakout session, and you'll have the opportunity to jump right in the room with these different presenters today, the panelists, and with Carl, and be able to ask your questions directly to them. So I hope that you'll stick around and do that with us. Let's see if I can get this to advance. Uh-oh, maybe not. There we go. At NCAT, we spend a lot of time reading and keeping up on a lot of the information that's available. And as Carl told us, there's new information coming out all the time about how to do grazing better. Um, I love the idea of, you know, we have we have soil for water, which we work for at NCAT, a lot of us. Um, Seth and Carl have soil for climate. I would love to see grazing for geotherapy. The idea that when we are taking care of the land, the land can take care of us. And Wendell Berry, uh, this statement by him, it, it just comes to the fact that it has to work for the land. It also has to work for us from a profitability standpoint. And so what we're going to do uh, here as we go through this is I want to introduce you to or let our panelists introduce themselves. Let's see if I can uh, let's see if I can get us right into the live. Um, NCAT has a Regenerators Atlas of America. And let's see if I can get it open so that you can see it. I would encourage you all to, to go and uh, look at soilforwater.org slash atlas. You can get your own farms and ranches on here and you can use this, um, this uh, platform to be able to learn about the different people who are doing this type of work. So one of the things that we can do is we can sort, uh, we can add a layer of precipitation zones, which I think is helpful. Let's see if I can get this to got too many things open on my screen here. Um, so that you can look through the precipitation zones and see what people are doing. And then you can go around and see all these different ranches. And here is Barney Creek Livestock and Red Clover Lambs. So at this stage, I'd like to introduce and welcome Megan and Malloy Lannon from Barney Creek Livestock and Red Clover Lambs. Let's see why this didn't come up. Probably have too many things open. There we go. So Megan and Malloy, if you'd like to give us just your ranch name and your precip zone and a little bit about your operation, we'll get started there. Excellent. So I'm Megan Lannon. Um, I own and operate Barney Creek Livestock with my husband and Malloy and her brother, Liam. Uh, we are in living, I just said Livingston, Montana and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And we're um, probably in that orange category um, and I'm gonna call it 12 to 14 inches. And here's Malloy. Hi, I'm Malloy Lennon. I run uh, Red Clover Lambs with Barney Creek Livestock. Um, just kind of a little sheep business. I started with uh, the use of a coloring book I did when I was 12 and have built to be just under 50 sheep, so yeah. Great. Well, welcome. We'll hear a lot more about, about each of these folks as we go along. Now let's see if I can navigate without being able to see the towns very well. I'd like to welcome Denise Rackley from Bennington, Indiana, and uh, she'll be telling us quite a bit about integrating stock dogs and livestock and soil health. Uh, welcome, Denise. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your operation? Hey, thanks for having me. Um, I'm currently in Indiana raising about 100 wool sheep. Um, along with those sheep, I have stock dogs to help me manage the flock. And I've also raised sheep in South Dakota. And moving from South Dakota to Indiana for grazing is a whole different ballgame. And I've learned quite a bit along the way. <laughs> OK, let's see if I can find Janet now. This must be you, Janet. 
Uh, Janet McNally is probably one of the most respected graziers that I know of in terms of thinking about soil health, living with wolves, and uh, raising site adapted sheep. And welcome, Janet, to the to the webinar today. And would you like to tell us a little bit about your operation? Well, thank you for inviting me. And um, I live in East Central Minnesota. We're north of what's considered the agricultural zone. Um, and the land here is considered marginal for farming. Uh, one of the reasons it's marginal is because in the late 1800s, we had what is still today one of the largest forest fires ever. It turned into a firestorm. And um, you'll, you'll have to think about this uh, twice, but it burned 400 square miles in four hours. You can think how intense that was. Anyway, uh, there's no, we started out with no soil organic matter here. Um, we have, I've had sheep and beef, currently just sheep. Um, and I was an unwilling uh, participant to in, into this in the sense that I just didn't think we could graze sheep in this way. I thought the nutrition wouldn't be suitable. Um, so I wasn't looking to get into it, but I'll tell, I guess a little later, I have an opportunity to tell you just what made me get there. Um, but I discovered so many benefits that uh, I stayed. <laughs> yeah, J Janet's story is, is amazing. It's uh, how everything can go wrong and you can learn how to thrive no matter what is thrown at you with grazing. So we'll share the screen again. And I think what we'll do is we will start with, um, let's see if I can get us here. Oh, yeah, I'm wrong. We'll, we're gonna start with uh, Denise here. So, um, whoops, that didn't work so well, did it? Apologies. Let's see if we can get it to go now. There we go. All right, so in this first little section, what I've asked our panelists to do is to give us a kind of a, a brief summary of, of their approach to regenerative grazing. What have you learned? What kind of, how do you do it? What are some key points that we as, um, as graziers might be able to learn from the lessons that they have? And so we'll start this section with Denise Rackley from Indiana. And Denise, if you'll just tell me when you want me to advance these slides, I'll do what I can here. All right, great. Keep an eye on time for me because I could be long winded. <laughs> um, so Carl gave us a great uh, in-depth look at soil health and the science behind soils. If we follow soil health principles when we're grazing and managing our livestock, then not only do soils benefit and forages are more nutritious, but our livestock benefit. So the five principles, just real quick, are keep the soil covered, minimize disturbance, increase plant diversity, keep plants growing, and integrate livestock. And if you are grazing livestock, doing those things will help your animals be healthier and make, make life easier for you. So the big deal is not overgrazing, as Carl said. Um, and like he said, if you could go to that slide, um, if we if we take the livestock and leave them in an area too long or bring them back too early, they obviously munch the grass down too far. Um, and it's not only the top of the grass that suffers, it's the roots. And once the roots are suffering, then the soil suffers as well. So keeping that in mind, moving livestock through different paddocks quickly takes care of soils, takes care of forages, and takes care of the stock. Um, 
And also being in a heavy clay soil area here and having parasites be a major concern for small ruminants. The paddock approach to grazing and rotational grazing moving animals through addresses the parasites concerns as well. So you can't have good pasture management without the parasite piece. So everything goes hand in hand, livestock health, soil health, and pasture management. Um, I'm sure everybody's heard, you know, leave, leave the grass over four inches, allow adequate, adequate rest, um, keep the forages vegetative, which again refers back to Carl's presentation. We need livestock to manage the forage, munch off the top so that it doesn't go to seed and it keeps growing, brings up those tender leaves. We move the livestock off and bring them back when there's enough grass that we're not harming the, the roots again. There's my helpers. <laughs> uh, also, I guess I just want to point out that, yes, we need to understand the principles of soil health, but grazing is definitely part art and part science. It's not going to be the same every place. It's not going to work the same every year in, this, in the place you're at. You have to adjust, you have to be flexible, and you have to let the the forages and the livestock educate you on what they need. And if you pay attention, you'll do great. I think that's a key point, the idea of paying attention, learning to observe and then to adapt. And I think we're gonna hear that as well. Thank you, Denise, for introducing us to your place. Now let's uh, go to Janet and learn more about what she's doing. And again, a lot of those key messages we heard from Denise will be echoed and then shown to us with Janet's story of the tale of two pastures. I'm going to stop my video because I just got some lag there. Um, Anyway, I, I have what I, my introduction to regenerative agriculture, or regenerative grazing is what I call the tale of two pastures. Um, and what you're looking at here is in 2006, we had a hundred year drought. And uh, on the left side is a piece of land I was renting. And on the right side is a neighboring piece of ground that was managed very differently. And, and when I say managed differently, these two pieces of ground were managed differently for about 25 years each on each side. Uh, my neighbor continuously grazed his cows. I used initially a kind of what I call 90s style grazing where I moved every uh, three or four, I, I didn't move every, I came back every three or four weeks. Um, we were told we had to keep the grass vegetative um, and this is why I was hesitant about mob stock grazing, because when you use mob stock grazing and you move daily, um, the forages are going to get pretty rank by the time you get back to that same spot in six or eight weeks. Um, so I, I was not, I, you know, I was listening to it, um, but I was hesitant. Anyway, uh, next slide. So what happened, what changed everything is that guy in the middle. Um, we actually had a visit from a pack of 23 wolves. If that sounds kind of incredible, it's actually documented in a book called The Wolves of Minnesota. Um, I sat down with the biologists uh, later that year after I lost 75 lambs in just 10 days and um, told them what happened and their exact words were, we were expecting that and found out that they already knew about this pack. But anyway, on the left side of this slide, you see um, the in the yellow circles are the places where I kept sheep. And at that time in the 90s style grazing, I had sheep at each location and they grazed in a rotational way, uh, returning every three or four weeks back to the starting point. What happened after this wolf came to visit is um, or not just a wolf, but a bunch of them um, was during this attack 
where I lost 75 lambs in just 10 days, I, I had to do something. I was desperate. It was like having a hemorrhage. And I had four rolls of electrified netting. Up until this point, I was using strand fencing. And um, it, I observed wolves diving right through that strand fencing. And I realized I had to have something more secure. So I had four rolls of Electronet. I've had always had a love-hate relationship with Electronet. Um, anyway, I got those four rolls out and I put uh, it was close to a couple hundred ewes inside that four rolls and they were lambing at, as, I, as this was all happening. And um, that's how I began mob stack grazing. So if we take the lower left circle on the far left of this picture and follow that blue arrow, that picture on the right is zoomed in on that field. And um, the sheep, instead of occupying all of those yellow circles, now only occupy a tiny piece of uh, one place in a given day. And I started moving every day. Of course, what happens is, is immediately, you know, a couple hundred ewes, uh, they ate that grass up in a half a day. So I started moving actually probably twice a day at that time. Uh, generally, most of the time I've moved once a day, um, but I keep moving these sheep. Now I want everybody to look at these two pictures, the, the left and the right. And what do you see on, um, by the way, I got to tell you this, this, these are aerial photos from Google Earth. And on the left picture, if you look at the three circles on the right side, it's been 15 years since I've been on that farm. And that farm got treated as a horse parking lot after I left. But what do you notice about this field that we've zoomed up, up on compared to all the neighboring fields? Do you see the dirt? You can actually see the dirt through from the air, okay? That's what the brown is. Now there's other brown areas. Um, oh, you see the creek down at the bottom here? That's all wetland. Um, that's a huge thousands of acres of wetland all around there. You see the tree line, which is where the high ground is. And I'm talking about the fields within the high ground only. Um, especially above the three yellow circles here on the right, you go right above that to the neighbor's place. That place has been just uh, hayed like once or twice a year. And that's all that had done for 20 some years. But anyway, I just want to point that out. Next slide. So the answer was to put the sheep all in a small group. And this is what it looks like. They, it's wall-to-wall uh, -wall sheep, I guess. And I move every half day or every day. It just depends upon the amount of grass. Next slide. So I was wondering why was that, that first slide that we looked at where I had all kinds of grass and my neighbor had nothing, that was after a hundred year drought. And I think I should point out that in the last 17 years, I've experienced three 100 year droughts. And that's just something to think about. This is in Minnesota. Anyway, what that first picture was, was we had a whole summer where it basically didn't rain. And then in September, we got one four inch rainfall. And on the left side was what happened on my pastures. And on the right side was what happened on my neighbor's pastures, which is nothing. I was very curious, like, why is there such a difference between these fields? Because it's the same piece of geology. So I went out and crossed my neighbor's fence and um, dug a sample on the left there. That's the continuous grazing side of the fence. And then I also pulled about 100 feet away, I pulled these other two samples that are on the right. The middle sub sample is, um, it's, mob stock grazing plus for seven years. It's just been mob stock grazing for seven years. Plus I also bale graze in the winter time and bale grazing accelerates this soil development faster than anything you can imagine. And then on the far right is just the, I call it rotational grazing or mob stock grazing. And this is in, the, in a drought that I took these. Next slide. So very,
curious. I, first, I thought it would be just that there must be more roots on my side of the, the fence. And there, you did see some more roots there, but there had to be more to the story. So I did a perk test and you can go on YouTube and see videos demonstrating how to do this. Um, next slide. So what I found out is that on um, the set stock, my neighbor's side of the fence where they uh, just kept the cows out there year round really, oh, a three quarter inch of water remained in the can after 15 minutes. On my side of the fence, the areas that were rotationally grazed but did not see any bale feeding, um, we still had three eighths an inch. So we doubled the amount of water that infiltrated in 15 minutes on the rotational and raised side. And then finally the bale grazing was just totally blew me away. In five seconds, all of the water was gone. Um, and when you go back to those soil samples, it really, you can see if we can back up one um, or two, back up two, that you can see in the middle sample there how the there's soil structure in there and how there's so much more ability for that soil to absorb water. And the other thing I want to point out is on the far left, you see that hard pan. There's actually two layers to it. Um, there's a hard pan there and you can see it somewhat on the far right, but you can see that the roots have already started to break it up. And it's more than the roots. I think it's the microbial life in the soil following those roots. And then of course the bale graze size side just or in the middle there just had far more development of um, microbial life in there. Okay, uh, flip, go ahead. So this is what, um, I'm about to show you a picture of a pasture, but this is what it used to look like in the nineties when we did our uh, three or four week rotation and next slide. This is what it looks like today. And um, the, the, there is a couple of weeks difference in when this picture was taken, but there is so much more grass here. And I should tell you that I started out with actually just woody plants, goldenrod and, and saplings and whatnot in this field. Um, now, when you walk across it, it's like a carpet. It, it's actually squishy um, under your feet, it's soft. Um, so when I trip and fall over the electronet, it doesn't hurt so bad anymore. <laughs> But uh, anyway, so this is what it looks like. I now only have 40 U's. Um, I'm semi-retiring here um, after a few surgeries, but um, I'm doing it on a micro scale. Everything is the same. It doesn't matter how many animals you have. You just uh, scale it down, whatever works. So, okay, I'm gonna stop there. Oh, I, I should add that. Meanwhile, I no longer have to drench a sheep during the summer because we have solved our parasite problem. Uh, by just simply giving it longer rest periods. Um, gosh, we just don't have any health issues with the animals other than deer liver flukes is the one thing that we do struggle with a little bit, but, um, but the animals are healthy and we're producing fat lambs off of grass, so, okay. Uh -huh. Wow, thank you, Janet. I just, every time I hear your story, I'm so inspired. Um, it, it's uh, great to see that by taking care of your grass, you take care of both your soil and your livestock a little later on, we'll be able to hear how that ramps up into human health as well. But at this point, I'd like to welcome again, Megan and Malloy Lannon from Montana to tell us about their approach to regenerative grazing. So I just always like to start um, before we, we give a lot of tours here um, at, on Barney Creek uh, Livestock on our Jordan Ranch lease um, that I'll mostly talk about and show pictures about today. Um, I always talk about context and I think it's great um, that we've had a lot of folks go before because I think it's a great place for a reminder. Um, when you read this quote, um, it's all about context. Um, and I don't need to read the quote for you. You can do that. Um, next slide. When I, when I give these tours again, when I talk about context um, and you really start getting into adaptive grazing, you really start getting into soil, you really start geeking out. And then pretty soon you've got, you feel like you've got answers and silver bullets and why is that person not doing this or doing that? And so 
let's say you drive by um, Farmer Brown's field and you see these cows and they're bunched up and it's 30 below and you say to yourself, they must be starving and you instantly start coming up with solutions and you head up over the hill and you see this, next slide. What you realize is that he's actually headed out at four o'clock and he's gonna move those into um, a bale grazing situation, which is right in line with, with everything that you've learned. And you quickly realize, wow, you know, um, I shouldn't be making assumptions um, and really getting curious and asking questions and getting to know our neighbors, just like we are today with the folks that are presenting. Um, so as we move through the final uh, presentations, I just want you guys to remember to keep Nietzsche's quote close and remember that everyone's got a different context. We're working in different areas um, with different cultural and social and family pressures. And so again, just be curious, be open, ask questions and leave those assumptions at the door. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it to Malloy and then it'll come back to me. Okay, um, hi, I'm Malloy Lennon. Um, I guess I'll tell, uh, just start off with how I, you know, my coloring book. So I made my coloring book when I was 12 years old. And there's a really long story that I don't have time to get into about that. But essentially, um, I got my coloring book started and it was for a 4-H project. Af and after I read Gabe Brown's coloring book about having diversity in not only your soil, but also your animals, I realized that we need some sheep. We only, we've only got cows, we need some more diversity there. So I printed my first 50 coloring books um, with Arrow's help and started to sell them. Uh, now I've reached over selling uh, a thousand copies and after printing expenses, I've put the profits back into my operation. Um, next slide, please. So I started off with just five lambs uh, in that photo on the far right. My parents um, are cattle people. So when we first got the lambs here, I started with some leftover random goat netting we had and we shoved them off the trailer and they immediately jumped out. And we had to deal with gathering five sheep across 160 acres, uh, along with my neighbor's roping skills and some permanent car scars from wearing my cowboy boots all day. Uh, I gained an, ep an epic story. Um, and so with those five lambs, I gained my first lease. I learned a lot about my hatred for electric netting and um, a lot about how I'd have to deal with water in the place that we live and all that type of stuff. And so then the year after that, I so I was doing feeder lambs with my first five. After that, I got 15, still using the feeder lamb system. And this is where I started realizing, wow, electric netting is not my deal. It's it requires a lot of labor and time that I don't have in the summer. And so I started looking around on YouTube and found uh, like a poly wire system where I use the same post we have for our cattle. And so with that, I went um, from five wires all the way down to now two um, and possibly one one day. And with those, I increased my flock um, to 26 and bought rams so I could start a ewe lamb business rather than uh, feeders. Um, I used a Greg Judy fencing design and I built a mo mobile shade system you can see in that far right photo. Um, and now this year I'm moving on, yeah, that next slide, I'm moving on to a system where I have a solar dolly which makes my fences that much more portable. And I'm looking into having um, a system using this a uh, device called a power post to make my fences even bigger. Um, yeah, and then I've also, during the winter, I faced a lot of challenges and started using a bale grazing system and all sorts of stuff like that. Do you so. want to talk about your parasites and what you learned? Oh, yep, I'd love to. So I've dealt with a lot of parasite issues, not a lot, but enough. And I found that, um, Janet mentioned this, but uh, increasing the time in between pastures when I come back has helped a lot. I've dealt with a lot of pink eye and a lot of um, worm issues. And that just comes back to spreading that out and using minerals. That helps my sheep quite a bit too. So, yeah. Good. All right. Um, I'll jump in with 
scoot over with <laughs> Barney Creek livestock. Um, we graze in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, we feel like that's really important because we graze for a lot of landowners here in the Paradise Valley. Some of these folks, this is their second and third home. Uh, and it's really been a big sell to get them to believe that we can bring back their ecosystem um, specifically for the reason that they bought a place in Montana. So our leases are really creative. Um, we've done some creative things that I won't go too deep in, but we graze on, I think I just said this, but a little over 800 acres um, on irrigated, which includes pivots, wheel lines, and K lines, and then also on dry land. Next slide. Um, this is actually um, on our pivots. We do a lot of uh, pretty creative things with infrastructure. You can see that on this pivot, the Kubota on the top, um, kind of middle more to the right, you'll see the Kubota there. There's a, a main uh, fence. We've separated uh, that pivot pasture in half. And so we call this the inner circle and the outer circle. So these cattle, a little over 100 head, have moved every day across the inner pivot. Now they're coming around, around um, into the second uh, outside of this pivot and where you see them right now. Our name of the game um, in the summer when we're irrigating, um, I hope I don't offend anybody, but it's our, it's our mantra. We grow grass and we kick ass. So we are moving constantly every day, moving water and moving cows. When we move them, next slide please up to our dry land non-irrigated, you will see that we're doing a lot of adaptive grazing in terms of land rehab. Um, in, that in the middle photo, you'll see just a lot of monoculture. You might walk through there and catch an alfalfa uh, grass, not very often, it's mostly smooth brome. So we have been working on this place. We're going on our fourth year. Um, it's looking better every year. Um, the far, the upper left picture, uh, they quote unquote have wheel lines. They don't work because these paddocks are set at an angle where those wheel lines walk. And so we've just basically kicked out the wheel lines and we're treating it um, as non as non irrigated. Um, that's our timer. Um, also, the far right is on dry land. Um, next slide. Is that it? Oh, this is Team Lannan. Um, we just won the 2022 um, Aldo Leopold Award. Um, Ooh, I get teary <laughs> for the state of Montana. Um, sorry for the work that we're doing. And I just wanted to put a quote in there about um, our goal for, for grazing these cattle is a number one to bring back land health. We're, we really geeked out on that. We didn't start as that. It started as a, a way um, to reduce inputs and make a profit. But on average here in our area, producers feed about two to two and a half tons of hay per animal unit. Um, we have been able to feed less than a third of a ton per animal unit, and we storm feed in the winter. So we have been grazing our tails off. Thank you. Wow, that was that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to just stop the screen share right now so that we can all you can see all of. I hope we can get the um, all four of our. Uh, three panelists and and me in the center there. I don't know if that's something that, thank you. We're getting closer. Janet McNally there, we'll get her up in there too. But um, we're, we've got so much to cover. I don't know about you, but I just love hearing these stories and how different it is from place to place. And having heard Carl talk about, um, you know, it, it's really time is it, you know, how long you're on the land, how long until you come back, I always think about it as like time is part of it, but then there's also the aspect of the grass and you know how much how much recovery time is there and how much residual is there that's left at the time that you move your livestock and and uh, Denise went over that. Um, as I've been talking with these women about how they do their grazing, what I've learned is that um, that we all manage our livestock a little differently over the course of the year. Sometimes we're moving them more often, sometimes less. And we're gonna kind of have to collapse and make really short 
answers to this question. If you want to hear more in depth, be sure to come to the breakout rooms and ask about it. But can we just have each of you answer the question, please? How often do you move your livestock? What tells you when to move them? And how does that change through the year? So let's go in reverse order. Um, how about you, Malloy? Let's talk about what, what you're doing. Well, I have been moving my sheep uh, daily and depending on uh, my schedule and things, sometimes it has to move to twice daily. And in the winter I use um, bale grazing. So they stay with a bale until they're done with it and then they go to a different spot, but yeah. So. Okay, good, good. How about you, Megan, with your cattle? Um, well, we on irrigated, like I mentioned, we move them every day um, and we keep the grass guessing. And what I mean by that, um, uh, Janet had mentioned it too, we're in a different spot every season, every year, every month. Um, and so we're really giving that ground, whether the grass um, is not in an active growth phase, we're, we're still on a different, but we calve in a different place. We have them in the winter in a different place. Um, and that also depends on where we might want to bale graze to add some more organic matter. Uh, the other thing that we do too during the growing season, we'll put um, seed in our mineral. And so we're increasing um, seed, uh, different bio, you know, getting that biodiversity in the grasses. And then we'll also put seed out when we bale graze. So we're constantly building that seed bank um, and really boosting those um, grasses. Great. Good. So Janet, how about how about you? And does it change over the course of the year? You've got a you've got a really extreme environment, you know, in terms of big winters and and humid summers and straight line winds and all this. So I'm guessing you might change how you do things over the course of a year. Yeah, it definitely changes with the seasons. In the early spring, I mean, everything is lush and vegetative. And we're going to just try to take like a third to a half of the plant and move. So I move when I see everything's not everything, but a lot of it's been bitten off once in the spring. Okay. Then in the midsummer, when things are coarse and rank and really tall, my goal is to trample. So I make the paddock small enough until I get a good trample effect. And when I'm getting good trampling effect, or when I've done a good trample, I'll move. And in that case, we're trying to eat the top three leaves of the plant and basically turn the rest into soil is the objective. And then in the fall, we get back into a situation like you see behind me. That's during a drought year, by the way. Um, but this is, um, this is very vegetative and we're back to trying to not take too much of it because obviously the sheep would eat all of that there. So I'm looking again to see that they've bitten every plant once and move. Um, so it changes from spring to midsummer to, to fall. Great. Yeah, and if people are interested in the approach that Janet just described, if you go to Atra, um, atra.ncat.org, um, and if you if you Google on Dave Scott, he's done a wonderful series of videos and blogs on on this approach, and he was also featured in uh, last week in this conference and and this idea of it changing over time what you are keying off of as you graze. Uh, Dave covers a lot of that, so this is this is great. Denise, how about you? What's it like in Indiana to manage your sheep? It's a lot of rain. Um, <laughs> you know, if I leave, if I leave the sheep anywhere too long, obviously they overgraze. But the rain also is a problem because they will muddy up smaller paddocks. So I tend to have larger paddocks move less often, but keep an eye on forage height because of parasites, and keep an eye on what the sheep are telling me. So they're gonna go in and eat what they want first. Sorry, you don't get the next pasture just because you ate all the good stuff. <laughs> so, so, I, so I'm a little tough on them. Again, it depends on the time of year and their nutritional needs because giving them the grass is part of it, but giving them the grass that'll meet their needs is what they need. So realizing in the spring, grass is gonna be growing fast 
Early spring, it will have less nutrition because of all our rain. It's kind of washy. They get a lot of moisture with it and not so much nutrition. So I graze ewes with lambs on the, on the best parts. Um, the rams get a crap pasture and they still get fat. <laughs> and, and so I also move, I move ewes with lambs out of the, the winter pasture where they lamb, put them on fresh pasture with some scrub kind of cover bushes and trees. Um, so, so those with the most nutritional needs are given the best pastures. Also our ground does not freeze in the winter. So I have to be aware of not messing up my other pastures moving sheep through. So by and large, they, they stay in two pastures in the winter, close enough where I can have electric to have water, not frozen. And so honestly, it's about ba balancing act. I don't have a set uh, prescription necessarily um, because it changes. One day can be 70 and the next day it's 20. So, so I, I've learned to kind of roll with the punches and listen to my sheep when they're complaining. Obviously there's a problem. <laughs> Yeah. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They they can be loud. Yeah. Um, so we're so short on time because I want to give each of our panelists a time to do a little bit of a parting piece. But I would be curious if each of you could could come up with one challenge that you've had to face as graziers that uh, that and how you've dealt with it. Um, again, uh, maybe just a couple minutes from, from each of you. So a challenge that you've had to face in order to have the type of outcomes that you want for grazing. I don't know if the audience noticed, but in the picture of Megan um, and, and Malloy's family, when they were in front of the barn, uh, Malloy had a shirt that said, it's not the cow, it's the how. And Megan's shirt was soil is sexy. And, and, you know, there's challenges in bringing those things together. So let's talk, let's start with the Lannans. What's a challenge you've had to overcome and how did you do it? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, you want to go first? Um, I think our, one of our biggest challenges is really um, balancing our labor inputs um, with moving. We've, we fall in love with our team members in terms of the people that we graze for and graze with we bring them on as a partner and wow we've just made some really great friendships and there's we've had to break up with some people and I think that's been really hard because we just don't have the manpower um I think I think it was um Janet that was saying it too in, in her discussion is when you get really good at growing grass um sometimes you can't make it across everything um, and so even if you're stockpiling, that's been, that's a new challenge that we've come across this year. So now we're going to partner with another producer that aligns with our values, um, in terms of they don't pour warmer, um, they, they do some things with their cows that we also do. Um, and we're going to maybe graze his beef for him, um, on one of our leases. Yeah. Um, my, I'd say my response to this question is a little bit more on the like animal side of things. A struggle I have had the entire time I've had sheep is them getting out. And so the fencing has been a huge part of my journey with sheep is figuring out, well, why don't I like getting, which one's going to cost less and whether it's um, biting the bullet on spend, spending more time with the sheep, having more labor, or if it's better to just buy the whatever I need and use it. You know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, Janet, how about you? Well, I'd say that the biggest challenge, the thing that was hardest for me to solve was getting good nutrition into sheep on that coarse rank forage in late June and July. That, and that was why I was reluctant to do this style of grazing in the first place. But it can, our grass 
can grow so fast and so rank. It, it may be different than some of you in other places, but um, you know, Minnesota explodes with forage growth in, in the spring and it, it can become very poor nutrition in a heartbeat. And so it has taken me a lot of time to figure out what is a good, how to manage it. And the answer to that was to trample it um, and not make them eat stuff that is not good nutrition. And uh, just a quick uh, synopsis of that is if you, you have a plant, your top three leaves are going to be 75% digestible nutrients. Your stem is 45% digestible nutrients and the bottom leaves may be only 35%. So it takes a 75 to 80% total digestible nutrients to fatten a lamb. So if you're making them eat that entire, let's, can I get both hands in there? That entire plant, you, you are starving them. So on uh, the stuff that was not that edible. Um, and then when the, grass came back, it comes back looking like what's behind me. Yeah, I love that. Denise, what's your big challenge and how did you overcome it? Um, similar to Janet, I think it's, it's matching the, nutri the nutrition for the sheep, the grazing that the grass needs and not letting it get either side of of wrong, be that, you know, too early or, or too mature. Um, and then just dealing with the changes in, in the weather that, you know, parasites are huge. Um, the, the clay soils stay so damp that parasites are a continual challenge. Um, obviously good grass management helps with that a ton but even not coming back for 45 days sometimes isn't enough. Um, and, and just figuring out that art that kind of goes with the science. And, and Malloy just needs a stock dog. That'll, that'll take care of that sheep getting out stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think. <laughs> but it shouldn't be any trouble. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is this is excellent to hear. Yeah. So what I'd what I'd like to do again, you know, I'm sure you guys are busting with questions and wanting to really interact with these folks. So stick around for the break, the breakout session. But what we're going to do right now is just kind of go to the to um, parting thoughts that each of these graziers have for, for you who are getting started in, in this conference called Growing Hope, we promised practical tools for a changing climate. And we as graziers are dealing with, you know, we feel the opportunity and at least some of us feel like a, there's a responsibility to be part of healing the climate. We are also dealing with needing to adapt to a changing climate, hotter hots and colder colds and always more wind. Um, and so I've asked each of the, of the people here today on our panel to have just a few closing words, and we're going to need to get that within about a minute for each person because we're bumping up against the end. So minute to 90 seconds, and we will start with you, Denise. Ooh. Um, okay. So I talked to Hugh Aljo, who is a grazing specialist with Noble Research Institute a few years ago. And he said, learn quickly, fail cheaply, and maintain flexibility. <laughs> um, so say so that again. You, say that again. Learn quickly, fail cheaply, and maintain flexibility. So so I'm stealing that from you. Um, I think if we if we have a soil up mindset, that will help us a lot. Um, what's good for the soil is good for the forage, is good for the stock. And then take, take the soil health principles and apply them. Talk to people, find a mentor, but realize, realize you still have to be flexible. Not everything that works for them is going to work for you. Wow. Great. We'll go to Janet now. Um, how about your, your parting wisdom for us, Janet? Okay. Well, um, I got into this 
just trying to keep my sheep safe. That's why I put them together into a mob in the first place. I stayed for the soil benefits. And this is just another soil uh, comparison. On the left is a horse paddock. You know how we all graze horses, right? Um, horse pastures tend to get beaten down. So it was continuously grazed for 20 some years. Um, middle is uh, mob stock grazing. And uh, I want to point out, uh, bring your cursor down to the bottom of that and look at the lumps or cottage cheese. That is microbial life going on down there deep into the soil. And on the far right is the bale grazing, which is just blows me away, the rapid change you can make with bale grazing. But I, I stayed for the soil benefits. When I saw what was really going on, I was blown away and I thought, you know, this is really the right way to go. And next slide. Oh. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot more to this story than just the soil, it's human health. And this is a, a rib roast from our pasture, totally grass fed, no grain. Um, and next slide. Something very few people understand. And I, oh, unfortunately, I don't know if everybody has this little panel on the right with everybody's little videos, but the ratio is what I really want to be able to see. I don't know if that's movable or not. But um, this is taken from a website called uh, Self Nutrition. And um, you've got your different meats. Most of those are grain fed meats. And omega-3 is an anti-inflammatory. Omega-6, if you have too much of them, is inflammatory. And the American diet has a ratio of 16 to one omega-6s to omega-3s. And um, unfortunately, you can't see here, or I don't know if it's everybody's problem, but my panel here is over top of the ratio column. But I believe the pork and the chicken were in the 16 to one or something like that. Beef, uh, even grass-fed beef is, uh, I think it was about three to one. But lamb, uh, see the pink bar, gra tamarack grass-fed lamb? We actually sent our lamb to Iowa State and had the omega, the fatty acids tested. And we actually are more comparable to farmed salmon than we are to the rest of the red meats above. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanna make a comment that New Zealand grass-fed, that's been updated since then and it looks more like my profile. Huh? But I'm just only is this good for the soil? Not only is it good for the climate, but this is awesome for human health. And, and we'll be sure to uh, get you this slide, people who are, in the, who are in the audience there so that you can see it because what it's showing is the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. The omega-6 is the one that causes inflammation. Um, for pork, it goes 24 to one. Um, down through grass-fed beef, about five to one. And uh, regular domestic lamb, 3.5 to one. And Janet's is 0.77 to one. So it's actually uh, beneficial in that way. So I will stop the share here. And I want to thank our panelists so much for this. We're running right up against the, the end of the time. Um, we will in the show notes that you'll receive when you get when you get um, the recording that you can look at, you'll be able to get links to the websites and some of the other information provided by Denise Rackley, Janet McNally, and Megan and Malloy Lannon. Uh oh, I forgot to let Megan and Malloy finish. Uh oh, sorry, ladies. <laughs> we can be really fast if not. Okay, what? be really fast. Okay, so uh, Pete always says, Pete's my husband, he always says, uh, people will stop him on the street and they'll say, man, I can't do what you do. I can't do that. And he says, you know what? You're right. And they look at him and he's like, it's about mindset. And so if, if you start to toy around with this, just like Janet's story, pretty soon you're hooked. Um, it's like eating an elephant. Just pick a little bit and try a little bit. And you got it. Go ahead, Malloy. And then for me to end this off, I'd say I'd like uh, ag to stay around. I think it's made such a big impact on my life and it brings people together. Um, and the type of ag that everyone here is doing is really um, showing that we can make it stick around and it to be good for 
the planet and future generations. So we have to adapt. I think that's wow. the perfect ending. Thank you.